This program is sponsored in part by the Elizabethtown College Summer Scholarship, Creative Arts, and Research Projects. Elizabethtown College. Educate for service. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. There was a time uh, when the newspaper said that only 12 men understood the theory of relativity. I don't believe there ever was such a time. There might have been a time when only one man did, because he's the only guy who caught on when he, before he wrote his paper. But after people read the paper, a lot of people kind of understood the theory of relativity in some way or other. But more than 12. On the other hand, I think I can safely say that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> Now, if you appreciate this and don't take the lecture too seriously that you really have to understand in terms of some model what I'm going to describe, and just relax and enjoy it, I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like, and if you will simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. So that's the way to look at the lectures, not to try to understand. Well, you have to understand the English, of course. But uh, in any sense, in terms of something else, don't keep saying to yourself if you can possibly avoid it, but how could it be like that? Of course, you'll get down a drain. You'll get down into a blind, blind alley in which nobody has yet escaped. Nobody knows how it can be like that. In episode one, I stated that one of the goals of physics is to find a coherent and comprehensive model of physical reality, the real external world, for Einstein. In episode three, I showed how no preferred reference frame, meaning no one's sense experiences can provide a privileged view of the real external world, suggest that the best model of physical reality is in fact a block universe according to special relativity. Consequently, in episodes 4, 5, and 6, I showed how the puzzle of the Big Bang, the flatness problem, the horizon problem, and the low entropy problem from relativistic cosmology, as well as the causal loop and grandfather paradoxes associated with closed timelike curves, are all resolved by viewing Einstein's equations of general relativity as an adynamical global constraint in the block universe, in accord with no preferred reference frame. In other words, they are all faux mysteries created by dynamical explanation in the ANSI view, since they are non-existent per adynamical explanation in the all-at-once view, explained in episode two. In the remaining episodes, I want to introduce and resolve some mysteries in quantum mechanics. As with those in general relativity, we will see that these quantum mechanical mysteries are faux mysteries created by dynamical explanation, since they are non-existent per a dynamical explanation. Quantum mechanics was introduced by Max Planck to solve the second problem in physics at the end of the 19th century, as I alluded to in episode three. That problem was to explain the black body radiation curve. That is, the intensity at each wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation emitted by material objects as a function of their temperature. The curve was known empirically, so it just needed to be explained theoretically. A Planck did so by assuming material objects could only emit and absorb electromagnetic radiation in discrete amounts. This led Einstein to explain the photoelectric effect using discrete bundles of electromagnetic energy called photons, which won him the Nobel Prize in 1921. So Smolin is approximately correct when he describes modern physics as Einstein's double revolution. Here's a simplistic introduction to quantum mechanics, which will suffice here. Newton's three laws of motion can be summed up by the global constraint the total momentum of all classical objects is constant. Uh, by classical objects, I mean Einstein's bodily objects, those things with world lines in space-time, as modeled by the divergence-free stress-energy tensor of general relativity. As we saw in an earlier episode, the divergence-free stress-energy tensor simply means that if you look at some region of space as a function of time, and all the momentum, the energy, and the matter flowing into that region of space has to be accounted for by what flows out of the region of space and what gets left behind or accumulates there. Here you can see the importance of the divergence-free nature of the stress-energy tensor, since classical objects are to persist in or be identifiable through time. Any particular classical object accelerates, deviates from geodesic motion in space-time, by transferring momentum with other classical objects. The time rate of change of the classical object's momentum is called force. Without force, aka interactions, classical objects wouldn't know of their mutual existence. Ultimately, all such momentum exchanges are due to quantum mechanics, assuming we've replaced Newtonian gravity with general relativity. For example, I only see classical objects in my surroundings because I receive some of their emitted photons. 
So our model of physical reality is simply one of classical objects interacting for quantum mechanics. Neither quantum mechanics nor classical mechanics is fundamental. Both are needed for this quantum classical reality. Escher's drawing hands is a nice analogy for this codependent quantum classical contextuality. Again, this is grossly oversimplified, but it will suffice here. The quantum mysteries I will introduce, delayed choice, quantum eraser, and no counterfactual definiteness, arise from a particular type of quantum interaction called entanglement, which Amir Excel calls the greatest mystery in physics, 2002. That is, the source emits two or more quanta of momenta that manifest coordinated measurement outcomes, like this delayed choice experiment done by Zeiling. So let's look at Seilinger's delayed choice experiment. We have a laser, and it emits photons off a mirror into a crystal, which then produces a pair of entangled photons, one and two. Photon one of the entangled pair will be detected by detector D1, which we will choose to place at location one or two. Photon two We'll proceed through the twin slits to detector D2 and create the pattern that we will observe over here, corresponding to our choice as to where to place detector D1 in positions 1 or 2. Let's watch what happens here for the first event. And we see we have our detection event for photon 2 at detector D2. And here is photon 1 corresponding to the other photon of the entangled pair, and it's nowhere near the location of D1 at position 1 at that time. And again, we have detection event here at D2 for photon 2, when its corresponding entangled partner, photon 1, is again nowhere near detector D1 at location 1. So the point is, all of these events that we're looking at over here and D2 are happening for the photon 2 before its entangled partner gets anywhere near where we've chosen to place detector D1. And we have a nice interference pattern. And now we're going to do, we can take the photon detector D1 and put it in position 2 for our photons 1. And again, look at the pattern created at D2 by photons 2. There we see our first detection event for photon 2 at D2, and again, photon 1 nowhere near detector D1. And that same situation obtains for the entirety of all the events at D2, and we see that we get this very distinctly different pattern, a particle-like pattern, at Detector D2 for photon 2 corresponding to where we've chosen to measure photon 1, even though our choice, our position here, uh, the photon 1 is hitting that after photon 2 has already clicked at detector D2, thus the name delayed choice. Apparently, photon 2's behavior is predicated on the delayed choice of the experimentalists. Quantum mechanics predicts this correlation between the locations of D1 and the patterns in D2, so apparently physical reality doesn't respect what we would believe as a necessary causal order between correlated events. Uh, recall Feynman's warning. Uh, here is Kim et al.'s 1999 version of delayed choice, which introduces quantum eraser as well. There's uh, an excellent video on the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. You can find it on YouTube. How the Quantum Eraser Rewrites the Past, Space and Time, PBS Digital Studios uh, video series. You can find that on YouTube. I'm just going to quick give some highlights from that video. Here, starting at 4.30, you see they show the paper from Kim et al. Here's uh, the schematic in this Kim paper. If you want to see it for yourself, you can read it for free right there in the archive. And here are the two patterns I'm going to show you. This is the particle pattern, we'll call it, and this is the wave pattern, we'll call it, and what the video does is it lays it out so that it's much, much more clear than, the, than this. So here's the experiment. You have your 
two slits right here, and part, and you have entangled pair of photons coming from each slit in each trial of the experiment. And photon two, again, I'll call it, that goes up here and makes your pattern that we're going to observe at the end of the day. Based on where photon one is detected, it comes down here, detected A or B. You know, if photon one is detected at A or B, then you have which path information for photon two, and photon one for that matter, but then photon two gives you this particle pattern. That's the one I told you about here. If rather photon one goes through this silvered mirror beam splitter and ends up at detectors C or D, then photon two up here gives you your interference pattern, wave pattern. And again, these events are happening after this event. That's your delayed choice aspect. And when it happens here, and you get your particle pattern that with which way information, and if it happens here, then that part that which way information is destroyed, and you go back to acting like a wave again. And that's why it's called the eraser, quantum eraser. Again, the result is predicted by quantum mechanics. Since quantum mechanics predicts these phenomena, most working physicists simply accept Merman's version of the so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, that is, shut up and calculate. But those of us working in foundations of physics are hoping that by answering this unfinished aspect of Einstein's revolution, Grismolin, we will have new insights on how to approach the other unfinished aspect of Einstein's revolution, that is, it may well help us reconcile general relativity and quantum mechanics. I'll let you read chapter 6 of our book, Beyond the Dynamical Universe, 2018, if you want to see some adynamical approaches to unification, quantum gravity, dark matter, and dark energy, inspired by the Lagrangian schema. So we definitely vindicated Smolin in that respect. Anyway, what exactly does the Lagrangian schema have to say about delayed choice quantum eraser? Recall my simplistic explanation of quantum mechanics earlier in this episode. If we accept that the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics amount to an adynamical global constraint for the distribution of quantum exchanges between classical objects in space-time, then quantum mechanics is simply an adynamical global constraint without a dynamical slash causal counterpart. Recall that we saw something similar in general relativistic cosmology. There we found that not all events in space-time, like the origin of the universe, lend themselves to dynamical explanation. And in those cases, we had to be content with their existence per global self-consistency, as defined by our adynamical global constraint, Einstein's equations in that case. If it bothers you that quantum constraints might actually apply to human decisions, for example, where to locate D1 in Xilinx's experiment, or whether or not to insert the eraser in Kim's experiment, and see our paper at this link. Essentially, it doesn't matter whether humans or beam splitters or computers are making the choices. But you ask, where is no preferred reference frame in all this? What does no preferred reference frame have to do with entanglement? In the next episode, I will show you another consequence of entanglement, no realism, aka no counterfactual definiteness, using the Merman device. And the episode after that, I will resolve the mystery of the Merman device using no preferred reference frame and adynamical global constraints in the block universe, precisely per Wilczek's challenge, thus taking you further beyond the dynamical universe.